Hello and welcome to today's lesson on quark theory, which is part of the particles and radiation topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at discussing the properties of quarks. So if we're successful and we learn in today's lesson, we can define quarks and explain how we know they exist. We can explain the quark changes that happen in particle decays and finally explain why it could be said that there are no anti-mesons, which is linked into the following part of the AQA A physics specification quarks and antiquarks now we've looked at the particle zoo and the different possible particle decays that can occur in the universe now this lesson we're going to look at a greater simplification of the particle zoo this simplicate this simplification is that all hadrons are made from smaller particles that we call quarks now a baryon is made from three quarks and the quarks combine to give the property of the baryon so the force holding the quarks together is the strong interaction this means that gluons are constantly being exchanged between quarks now if it's a meson a meson meson is made from one quark, one antiquark, and the quarks combine to give the property of the meson. Once again, the force holding the quarks together is the strong interaction, so the gluons are being exchanged by quarks. Now, it's important to note that the quarks must exist within four femtometers of each other at all times for this to occur. Now, the defining characteristic of a hadron, which is a particle made from quarks, is that it experiences the strong interaction, as it's the strong interaction that holds these quarks together as either triplets or pairs. So we've got to consider the following. What are quarks? How were they theoretically postulated? How were they experimentally discovered? And what impact does quark theory have on particle physics? So, to provide an underlying principle to the particle zoo, Mary Gell-Mann proposed the quark theory, which is that all hadrons are made from smaller particles called quarks. Baryons are made out of three quarks, antibaryons are made out of three antiquarks, and mesons are made out of one quark, one antiquark. Now, quarks cannot exist in isolation. They can't exist separately. Now, currently, we believe quarks to be fundamental particles. Now, theories have proposed that quarks and leptons are made out of strings of energy vibrating at different frequencies, which we call string theory, but currently that's beyond our current level of capability to test. So Gelman proposed that baryons are made out of three quarks. Each quark possesses a fractional baryon number, a fractional charge, and a lepton number. These add to form the overall baryon number, charge, and lepton number of the baryon. Now a baryon can only have integer baryon number, charge, and lepton number, showing that only certain quarks can combine to make a baryon. Baryon. So it's a very important idea. So we've got to understand that this idea of adding up the fractional baryon number, charge and lepton number of the quarks will give the overall baryon number, charge and lepton number of that baryon. Now Gelman originally named the quark after the sound made by ducks, but for some time he was undecided on the actual spelling for the term he intended to coin until he found the word quark in James Joyce's book Finnegan. Wake, where it says three quarks for muster mark, sure he's not got much of a bark, and sure any he has, it's all beside the mark. Now, Gelman was inspired as he believed there was only three quarks. Now, Gelman also proposed that mesons are made out of one quark, one antiquark, and this means that we can add the quarks, baryon number, charge, and lepton numbers to give the overall baryon number, charge, and lepton number of the meson. Now, it's important to note that an anti-mason is the same as a mason, as would still be comprised of one quark, one antiquark. Now, it's interesting to also note that uh, Gelman proposed that quarks cannot exist by themselves. They need to exist in twos or threes. This occurs because quarks have a property called colour. Now, it's not really colour, it's just a quantum mechanical effect. Now, the most stable configuration for quarks is being colourless. This means they've got to combine and cancel out individual colours to become colourless. So, as a result, quarks tend to exist in their most stable configuration, which is either pairs or triplets. Now, if you to try to remove a quark from its it's baryon or meson, it actually gains potential energy doing this, and this potential energy is then converted immediately into making new quarks for the existing quarks to combine with, so it makes the configuration stable. So it's important to note that quarks cannot exist as single quarks. This is called quark confinement. Now, Gelman proposed there are six quarks in the universe, and each type is called a quark flavor. You've got the smallest and most stable quark, the up quark, you've got the down quark, you've got the 
strange quark. Now this quark gives a particle the strangeness property, the charmed quark, the top quark, which is the largest quark and as such the most unstable quark. And so this means the top quark is the rarest quark in the universe and it was only first observed in 1995 and finally the bottom quark. Now it's also important to note that Gelman proposed that these quarks along with leptons and bosons produce everything in the universe, which is what we call the standard model of matter. So the quarks come in three different pairs which have contrasting properties which we call generations. So the first generation is the up and down quarks, the second generation is the strange and charm quark, and the third generation is the top and bottom quarks. Now the higher the generation, the higher the, the, higher the mass of the quark. This means it's less likely for the quark to exist. So the, this means first generation quarks, up and down quarks, are much more common than third generation quarks. This is why most of baryonic matter are protons protons and neutrons as they're baryons made from first generation quarks. So Gelmer proposed in the standard model of matter there are six quarks up down strange charmed top bottom which we find here in the part in the particle model of matter diagram. So we know there are six different quarks in our universe and they can combine to form mesons or baryons but the quarks will only experience the strong interaction. Now any particle made from quarks is referred to as a hadron but quarks do not exist in isolation. Now only baryons have a non-zero baryon number and there are also antiquarks found in the antimatter standard model. Now antimatter has the same rest mass as matter but opposite other properties. You've then got leptons, which refers to electrons, muons, taus, and neutrinos. Now, leptons do not experience a strong interaction. Leptons only experience the weak interaction and the electromagnetic interaction if they are charged. Only leptons can have a non-zero lepton number, and there are also antileptons found in the antimatter standard model. Now, antimatter has the same rest mass as matter, but opposite other properties. Now, you've finally got the exchange particles. These are particles which can exchange in the universe to mediate a force, energy and momentum. Now the properties of the exchange particle leads to the property of the force interaction. Now these particles are referred to as virtual particles since they only exist for brief amounts of time and can never be observed directly. Now you might wonder why the quark flavours were given their names. Well up and down are named after the up and down components of spin which they carry. Strange quark was given their name because they were discovered to be components of strange particles discovered in cosmic rays years before before the quark model was proposed. Now remember these particles, kaons, were deemed strange because they had unusually long lifetimes as they only decay by the weak interaction. Now as of 2020, we're still unsure as to why strange quarks behave in a different way to the other quarks. Now the, in the terms of the charmed quark, Glashow, who proposed the charmed quark, said we, had ca we called our construct the charmed quark for we were fascinated and pleased by the symmetry it bore to the subnuclear world. Now the names bottom and top were coined because they were chosen as logical partners for up and down quarks. Now in the past, bottom and top quarks have been sometimes referred to as beauty and truth, but these names have fallen out of use. Now whilst truth never did catch on, an accelerator complex is devoted to massive production of bottom quarks are sometimes referred to as beauty factories. Now top and bottom quarks are rarely observed in nature as they are very massive, so they are unstable and need lots of energy to be produced in high energy events. Now following on from Gelman's postulation of quarks, quarks were discovered in Stanford, California in 1968 using inelastic scattering collisions with electrons. So in these particular experiments they accelerated electrons to 6 giga EV, 6 giga electron volts and they found a large number fired at neutrons and protons scattered at a large angle. This indicated that neutrons and protons were not of uniform density but had point light charged particles inside of them which were the quarks. Now this is actually a very similar in experimentation to Rutherford scattering except it's carried out on a much smaller scale because electrons when they're fired at neutrons and protons scatter off at high angles a bit like how alpha particles scatter off at high angles from the nucleus showing that there must be an internal structure to the particles. Now all hadrons can be described in terms of quarks and antiquarks. So baryons are three quarks not necessarily the same type. Antibaryons are three antiquarks not necessarily the same type. 
type, mesons are two quarks. One quark, one antiquark, but not necessarily the same type. Now, the following are examples of quark compositions of different hadrons found in the particle zoo. Now, you've got to memorize the quark composition of the proton and the neutron. A proton is up, up, down, and a baryon is down, up, down, or dud. Now, an antibaryon is the antiquark uh, uh, equivalent of the baryon. So, for example, an antiproton is anti-up, anti-up, anti-down, whilst an anti-neutron is anti-down, anti-up, anti-down. Now, for a meson, you've got to be aware that there is one antiquark and one quark. So, for example, a pi minus is anti-up, down. Now, you're expected to work out the particle family from the quark composition. So, let's look, for example, at a proton. So, you're expected to know that the, what the quark structure of the proton is. It's up, up, down. So, the Quarks are attracted to each other by the exchange of a gluon or the exchange of a pion, whilst a neutron is down, up, down, and once again these quarks are attracted to each other by the exchange of a pion. Now, in decays, we've looked at protons turning to neutrons, this happens because one quark changes flavour. Now, the force responsible for a quark flavour change is the weak interaction. Now, a quark changing into another quark is called changing a quark's character. Now, only the weak interaction can change the quark's character and we observe change in a quark's character as a particle changing type so the exchange of the w and the z bosons causes a quark to change character to change flavor so in a neutron turning to a proton, a down quark changes to an up quark. And in a this force responsible again for quark changing flavor is the weak force. So it's the exchange of the W and Z bosons. Now, in addition, like we said before, you should be able to work out the anti antiparticle composition of their particle um, equivalent. So you should be able to work out the quark structure of an antiparticle from its particle. Now, remember, you should know the quark composition of mesons. Now, you expect to deduce the quark structure of a meson from its property. So to do this you must work out the charge of the meson to then use this to work out the possible quark and antiquark which could sum to that charge. Now if a meson contains either a strange or an anti-strange quark we call it a kaon. Now the only mesons which can have a strangeness is a kaon. Now other mesons like the pion cannot contain a strange quark, only the other quarks. Now you are, you are expected to deduce the quark structure from from, of a meson from its properties, but you don't need to memorize the individual compositions of the different mesons. So here's the information you were given on mesons in your examination. Now, like we mentioned before, can you get anti-mesons? You can't get anti-mesons because the antiparticle of any meson is the quark-antiquark pair you had previously, so it's just therefore another meson. Now you can observe this because if you notice, okay, if you reverse K+, plus, so you would have up anti strange and that could go to that would could possibly go to anti up strange it's just the k minus so it's another meson so just to clarify we know our six different quarks we've got the up quark the down quark the strange quark the charm quark the top quark and the bottom quark now you're given all of this information in your examination now just to note for by the way you can see on the mass values in this table there is not a range of values for the mass and the up quark up quark and the down quark because we actually do not know their actual masses, so it's in that particular range. Now, it's also important to know that the strange quark exhibits strangeness, so it has a strangeness of minus one. So, as we mentioned before, the quark properties should add up to give the overall properties of the particle, and you are given this information in your data book. So an example of this is the following. So we know that a proton is up, up, down. Now from the data sheet, we know that the charge of an up quark is plus two thirds, and of a down quark is minus a third. So if we have a proton, this tells us it's plus two thirds, plus two thirds, minus a third, so therefore they all add up to plus one. And the barrier number for an up and a down is plus a third, so plus a third, plus a third, plus a third equals plus one. Now the lepton of all of them is zero, the strangest is zero, so they're both going to be zero for the proton. So like we said before, each quark possesses a fractional number, a number for the baryon number and the lepton number and the charge. These add together to form the overall baryon number, charge and lepton number of the baryon. But remember, the baryon can only have an integer baryon number, charge and lepton number, showing that only certain quarks can be combined to make a baryon. So let's just summarize what we've learned in today's lesson. We should know the properties of quarks and antiquarks in terms of charge, baryon number and strangeness. Know that comp combinations of quarks 
quarks and antiquarks are required for baryons for the protons and neutrons only, antibaryons for the antiproton and antineutron only, and mesons, pions and kaons only. You should be have knowledge of the up quark, the down quark, and the strange quarks and their antiquarks, and we should understand what happens when a neutron decays. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to define quarks and explain how we know they exist, explain the quark changes that happen in decays, and explain why it could be said there are no anti-mesons. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on quark theory, which is part of the particles and radiation topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for listening to today's lesson, and have a lovely day.